Folks, um, before we get into this episode, which is an interview with Ben Fong about drugs and the death drive and the fundamental fantasies of drugs and so many other things, we have to do what I can only hear in my head as uh, Sam Adlerbell and Matt Sitman from Know Your Enemy saying, let's do a little, we got to do a little housekeeping. Should we do some housekeeping, Matt? So we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. It's been just about six months since we launched Ordinary Unhappiness. Wow. Mm -hmm. We have been so grateful for the response from listeners. um, And we have gotten so much feedback from so many of you across, um, you know, social media and Patreon and and all of these things. So we're going to, we're going to pursue a couple of different tracks all at once. And we're going to do it in a slightly more standardized way. So you know a little bit more what to expect. And so we can be really consciously, um, no pun intended, working in all of these registers at once. So here's roughly what we're going to do. Once a month-ish, we're going to keep doing interview episodes. Once a month, we're going to do an episode on some sort of key psychoanalytic text or concept um, because we are, above all, teachers. And like this, we are we are invested in in doing that kind of work. And then we are actually shifting from having one to two Patreon episodes per month so that we can keep doing the standard edition and actually hopefully not make that like the eternal deferred sort of thing because, you know, we're about to be do do episode four and we're still on volume one out of 23. So that's going to be once a month. And we are also going to do one other Patreon episode per month, which is wild analysis where we deal with some sort of cultural object or other think about our, artifact. Com- our conversations artifact. about a dangerous method or a conversation about Joss Whedon. Yeah. And we're doing Buffy. one on Barbie. That's going to come out very soon. Um, but so we're going to be working in all of these registers simultaneously, but you'll know a little bit more. And I do expect this will allow us to do a bunch of different things at once and to have our sort of feet in different uh, temporalities at the same time. We'll talk about the history of psychoanalysis, uh, linearly working through Freud and maybe later doing additional series like that. But also we'll be talking about things where you don't have to follow with a text. I mean, yeah. you don't have to, per se for the Freud stuff either, but like if you don't want, if you want to just like process contemporary political events or contemporary cultural artifacts, we're going to be doing that too. And also we're going to be having on people whose work we admire or who are otherwise fans of uh, to kind of think through stuff from a psychoanalytic perspective, whether or not the work that they're doing is explicitly psychoanalytic. So in other words, we want to kind of like do this kind of multi-form multiply oriented, well, I guess we could say over-determined approach to thinking about and thinking with psychoanalysis in a way that is is accessible, hopefully for everyone involved, and at the very least has multiple points of entry. So people can choose, you know, what things they might like more, what things they want to pursue more. And at that point too, I want to say, and I think we all want to say that we're so incredibly grateful for the support that has made this possible. We're, yeah, we're, we're absolutely, yeah. We're blown away. We're committed to doing this entirely based upon the support of uh, th- that people have offered on Patreon. and Yeah, because we don't want to shill for like online mental health uh, apps. No, We're yeah. not going to do that. Or Hard pass. Or Blue Chew or any of the other things. That <laughs> normally, yeah, we, we, we're, we're deliberately forsaking that in favor of being responsive uh, to what we want to do and to what we think it, other people want to hear. And so at that point, we really want to encourage you to Continue to, you know, support us on Patreon if you do, to uh, consider supporting us on Patreon if you don't, and in any event to recommending us to uh, your friends or reviewing us on various platforms, uh, because that really does mean a lot, and it very much does give us life. And so this is the program that we'll have going forward, but also, too, we want to stress that, like, as interest grows, you know, hopefully as it does, we may be able to do other things, too, down the line or even expand the offerings uh, as well. So in any event, we're just so grateful to you for listening. Okay, housekeeping is over. We hope you enjoy listening to this interview with Ben Fong as much as we enjoyed recording it. Bye. Love you. You've taken modafinil? <laughs> yeah. It's very important. If, if, if you taken this, Ben, have you ever had that? Have we talked about that? Modafinil? No. I mean, I've read a lot about it, but uh, I've never taken it. I mean, it seems unpleasant to be 
kept in that kind of state for a long period without sleeping. It, 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 it's very much like the experience of it, it has that kind of like you've put in blinders kind of thing. Like you've got that sort of like mm-hmm. hyper focus that you might associate with amphetamines, except there's no positive feedback whatsoever. Like there's no, there's no euphoria. Right. There's no like, oh, this is really interesting. This is really enjoyable. You have no, no, there's none of that dopamine sort of shit. It's just like, I just have to keep staring at this document and it oh, doesn't, gosh. It, it, it's not pleasant. And, and it, Ooh, it weirdly becomes like, yeah. you find yourself like as other things come into your consciousness, getting a little kind of pissy at them in a way that's like, might be similar to like an amphetamine kind of like yeah, thing, yeah. but it just doesn't. None of the euphoria none, associated with none. it. Yeah. It's just like, why am I glued to it? It's also, there's no, there's no like, because it's, you're just sort of glued to it. There's no feedback to like, well, my performance is getting better at this. Or like now at least I can, re- I can cut through certain anxieties that I have about something or I want right, to fall down. Right. Like, you know, this, the, the danger there is you fall down a rabbit hole or something. Right. But here it's like, there's no fulfillment in it. Right. So it only makes sense to me. Like if you're literally flying a plane, if like you have nothing else you can do and you, what you have to yeah, do is yeah. look at this shit. But there's nothing else to it. It's it, there's no you. Can, it, it's not like grinding no your teeth and being like I'm in that. I'm in this truck. I'm doing like the vanishing point shit. There's none of that. It's it's weirdly <laughs> anhedonic. It doesn't. It's not good. Yeah, I mean, as I understand, like it's it's development. Uh, the military has been very involved, and for pilots, it makes a lot of sense. And I yeah. think that uh, I read somewhere that they've kept uh, soldiers up for like 85 hours straight. Yeah, on modafinil. Oh my which god, is pretty, that sounds like nuts. hell. But it does feel like, um, I mean, just from reading the descriptions about it, that the that the kind of um, interest that you have with amphetamines, not just like the energy and the focus, but like the interest in doing the task is not really there, even though you're you're, you're kind of doing it. And 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 that would, that would kind of make sense that like it's the interest that would exhaust you in a way. It's the interest yeah. that would like make you flag on amphetamines and need some kind of recovery. If you're just doing the thing without like just kind of on autopilot, the promise of modafinil kind of makes sense to the military who yeah. who want that in a way. <laughs> they don't yeah. care about the interest in the task. They just care that you do it. I think that the autopilot metaphor is, I think, exactly the one. Because like when I, I remember yeah. when I learned about the the provincial modafinil stuff. It was after that episode in the early 2000s where those guys flying the Harriers and the U.S. Marines cut the cables of that uh, gondola in the Italian Alps and like all these people fell to their deaths and there was this question was like, how long were these guys flying and what precisely were they on? And no one wanted to talk about it, right? But it it, it did become this thing where at the time the materials I was reading from in like defense spaces were like, the pilot is the weakest link in the weapon system Mm. insofar as that you know right. like unlike a plane that well, like they have to cut like you know you can't they have to come down they have to use the bathroom they get tired and every minute that the thing is sitting on the tarmac is is, is minutes it couldn't be it isn't in the air so it becomes this like it puts you on autopilot much in the same way as you put the plane on autopilot just to keep going and it really right. it, yeah there's no blitzkrieg joy to it it's a weird it's kind of right. a creepy yeah, yeah. fucking thing these damn human beings getting in the way of good military strategy. Yeah. Well, I, I thought the most interesting part of that section in the book where you're talking about modafinil is the, you only, there's, there's no recovery, right? Like you, you yeah, sleep I mean, that's, for, that's sort of why so, it's been prized by the military. Cause you, I mean, the, theoretically, I, I, I think that um, from, from what I've, I've read since it sort of seems like there are longer term effects yes. of modafinil use that do have a degrading effect. But like the promise is that you could be up for like 36 hours and sleep for, you know, seven or eight hours and be fully recovered. Uh, unlike yeah. with amphetamines where there's more, more of a crash involved. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about about the book is that like there's a fundamental, if we're, if we're going to put it in psychoanalytic terms, there's a fundamental fantasy for every drug yeah. that you profile. And for modafinil, it is that you do not have any of the restrictions of the human body, <laughs> right? You become the machine. Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There, um, there's this great book about speed called, um, I think it's just called On Speed by yeah. by Nicholas Rasmussen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's his basic argument. He's like, you know, when when amphetamine was first put on the market in the 30s, um, uh, the the maker, Smith, Klein and French, uh, now GlaxoSmithKline or GSK, mm-hmm. they, they, they mold different purposes for it. They're like, okay, what does this thing do? Well, it helps you lose weight. It helps you stay peppy. It's a mood elevator. Um, and it helps with mental and physical performance. Um, they eventually marketed it as a mood elevator at first, but you know, throughout the course of the history of amphetamines, it's been sort of marketed to all three purposes. 
And uh, his argument is that, you know, there, there's other drugs that help us do these things now. Lose weight, um, yeah, you know, uh, mood elevators, the SSRIs and whatnot. Sure. But it's really amphetamine that created a certain dream mm-hmm. in America. It's the dream that we can be thin, peppy and smart all the time. Um, and it's, re- it's really that dream that's, that's what uh, amphetamines inaugurated more than the actual effects of amphetamines. to Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin. I'm Patrick Weinfield. And today we have with us special guest Ben Fong. Ben is Honors Faculty Fellow and Associate Director of the Center for Work and Democracy at Arizona State University. He's the author of Quick Fixes, Drugs in America from Prohibition to the 21st Century Binge out from Verso. And his other writing can be found in Jacobin, Catalyst, The New York Times, and Damage Magazine. Um, I also have known Ben for a long time since graduate school. I can tell you that he is a brilliant writer and thinker. And I actually had an email half composed to him before the drug book came out to be like, do you want to come talk to us about the death drive? And then I found out that this book was coming out and I was like, no, wait, do you want to come talk to us about drugs and the death drive? Um, So without further ado, welcome, Ben Fong. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, both. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you. Yeah, just to plug the, the, the death drive book. Did, did we, Abby, did you list the name of it? I'm sorry. I will. Okay. Okay. It, 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 just, just to plug, it's his death and mastery for people who haven't heard it. it, it it's, it's the drive theory and the subject of like capitalism, it's, right? It's, it's great. Yeah. I it's, was going to get into it. Okay. It's, it's in my second question. Don't worry. Okay. Don't worry. And it'll go. It's better than just the death drive, though. It's the death drive and drugs. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ben, we're so happy to have you with us. Um, and I know that that you come to to this work in a way that will be really interesting to our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit about your path to psychoanalysis and thinking psychoanalytically and how that informs you? And you can, you know, answer this as, as a writer, as, as a scholar, as a human, in terms of your politics, in terms of your interpersonal life, however you want to answer that. Sure. Uh, well, it was very much through theory. You know, I was in graduate school in, uh, in, in religious studies at Columbia with you. Uh, and the first year I was there, I was just reading a lot of Freud and a lot of Klein. And uh, I found out about this training institute up at the medical center at Columbia. And they had an affiliated scholars program that allowed me to take the theory courses. So I was like, great, signed up to do it. Um, at the time, there were still uh, some disciplinary boundaries uh, around uh, a- analytic training that I think have um, considerably loosened since then. So I know a yeah. number of people who are now doing like academic to analyst kind of paths. Um, when I was in graduate school, that kind of thing certainly wasn't available. I know that they had been talking about the kind of thing, but they they were still pretty rigid about saying, um, you know, no, like you can do the theory courses, but you can't do the clinical courses unless yeah. you have an MD or a PsyD or something like that. Um, so I just did the theory classes, but they were, they were terrific, uh, really great instructors there. I just, um, you know, was able to learn about the longer history of psychoanalysis beyond just the big names. And, um, and yeah, as you said, ended up writing my first book about analytic drive theory, uh, specifically its relationship to Frankfurt School Critical Theory. And yeah, very, very different book than the one we're mainly going to talk about, but there's there's some overlap there as well. So let's get into your new book, um, Quick Fixes. How, how did you come to this project? Um, and we would also like to hear about its connections to the previous, your previous work, including that first book, um, Death and Mastery, Psychoanalytic Drive Theory and the Subject of Late Capitalism. I'll, I'll try to answer the question about the book connection first, because it's sure. kind of the more difficult question okay. for me. <laughs> um, so uh, in Death and Mastery, I I try to answer, you know, this elusive question of what, what, what Freud was after with this concept of the death drive, which is introduced in a remarkably confusing text beyond the pleasure principle. 
And following Hans Lowold and, and others, um, I think about it broadly as just involved in all of the ways in which we undermine, um, sometimes destroy, and in any event, just escape the experience of having an ego. Yeah. Um, egos are great things. They're also terrifying things. Um, and in the later part of the book, I argue that, uh, you know, from a psychoanalytic point of view, gratifying the death drive is um, is kind of central to the work of the culture industry, that this 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 mode of subjectification that the Frankfurt School uh, authors were after, I, I found it best described in involving some kind of direct death drive gratification that the culture industry allows us to um, temporarily escape our egos in ways that sort of rejuvenate us to allow our egos to function better almost. It, it, you know, described in that way, I guess you could say there's some... Connect, uh, conceptual connection between the projects. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested also in, uh, in in quick fixes, the new book, um, in in drugs as they're involved in the pursuit of that same kind of oblivion, the sort of pursuit of a kind of ego death. You could say, yeah. um, that's my best attempt anyway <laughs> to connect the two projects. I, I, I would say that the truth is that um, there's there's not a, a great deal of connection between them. I, I've always thought psychoanalytically and, and will continue to do so, but psychoanalysis itself doesn't feature a great deal in the book. Yeah, I mean, re really, uh, you know, the kind of motivating factors for the book were were twofold. Uh, so first, um, you know, I, I just sort of noticed that everyone around me it seemed to they seemed to be on various drugs and increasingly so. Um, sometimes this meant that they were more open about their um, their recreational use, sometimes being more open about their medical use. Um, and we can get into this more in a moment, but uh, I found that the anecdotal evidence that a lot of people were on drugs was confirmed in in, in the numbers and the research. Um, and then the second reason is that I, I've taught a class at ASU for many years now on the sociology and history of drugs. And um, the, the kinds of things that were related um, to me by students in the class, there's a discussion seminar, so I got to hear a lot from them. Uh, was just really interesting. You know, I, I was, when, when I first started teaching the class, I was expecting a lot of, you know, for, for lack of a better term, like stoner kids to be taking the class. Um, uh, but the, the, those who came and sort of were most interested in the material um, were, were actually sort of drawn to the discussions about psychiatric medications. And many of them related very ambivalent experiences about being on these medications from a very young age. And, and in the class, a lot of the times when we were talking about um, drugs, I found that they were able to talk about, um, you know, social pressures, exploitation, inequality, sometimes even capitalism itself uh, in, in ways that they wouldn't otherwise be able to talk about these things. And so I sort of saw drugs as a gateway to talking about social critique. So it's the, the only way in which they're a gateway, I guess. That, that's fascinating. And, and, and I, it occurs to me that just in the odd event that you haven't seen some of this material, I wanted to, to sort of softball you to, for today or to use it some later opportunity, uh, a little bit, a, a pair of lines that I found going through some of Freud's letters, uh, both from the beginning of his career and the end of career of his career. I, you know, when he was full of life and then when he was preoccupied with the question of the death drive about his own personal sort of drug use and not cocaine, which of course you deal with at length in the book, but you also deal with uh, tobacco and, and other types of recreational substances. We'll talk about those moves later, but here, here are two little uh, lines uh, from 1894, a letter to Fleece, his friend. Uh, and then from 1930 uh, to Lou Andreas Salaman. And, and just, I, I, I reread these thinking up about your book and having read your book and that they seemed, well, you could say overdetermined. Um, so this is a letter he writes in 1893, 1894 to his friend Fleece after having tried to give up cigars and having gone seven weeks cold turkey, right? Uh, from the first cigars on, I was able to work and I was the master of my mood. Prior to that, life was unbearable, right? And so, it, you know, he's... he's uh, tobacco consumption is titanic. I mean, I've read numbers like 30 something cigars a day. I don't know how true that is. I don't know if he's finishing them, whatever that might mean. Uh, in any event, by 23, he has oral cancer and this is the oral cancer yeah. that's going to kill him. He's doing it. And then in 1930, on doctor's orders, he has to try to quit, quit again. And this is when he writes to Lou Andreas Salome. I have completely given up smoking after it had served me for precisely 50 years as protection and weapon in the combat with life. So I am better than before, but not happier. And I, I, I felt like there was just so much there in terms of the usage of, of drugs as at once being pleasurable, 
uh, and part of how we sort of relate to things above all to work or maybe seek to find pleasure in work and give us some sense of control, but also that uh, use of these things can itself be, you know, it can lead to terminal outcomes. Yeah. And there's these sort of series of trade-offs where eventually you hit diminishing returns or you've made a choice for yourself much earlier that finally catches up to you. It felt very death drivey, but it also felt like things I can imagine people saying about smoking now, you know, in, in as many words or other drugs too. Uh, I hate to say it, but it reminded me of uh, of a very different source. There's this uh, Tucker Carlson clip going around about him railing against the dangers of marijuana. Uh, and by comparison, how like they were being very unfair to the tobacco industry. And he closes the clip saying, Because nicotine frees your mind and THC makes you compliant and passive. That's why. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's a terrific, uh, clip. I think you can find it just about anywhere. Um, but no, I mean, it, the, the quotes that you just, just mentioned it, it speaks to a certain, um, a certain dream of drug consumption, which is that through the use of drugs, we're, we're able to optimize ourselves. Yeah. We're able to make ourselves into, uh, the kinds of masters, uh, of our own lives that we want to be. Uh, that's certainly um, the case in the history of amphetamines, but just basically a- a- any stimulant, uh, it's sort of like what helps us get up for the day to do the things in the way that we want to do them. Uh, but as you say at the end there, um, the consequences can, you know, be quite deleterious that like we're not, um, we're not machines, we're not always able to perfectly inhabit our self conceptions and always trying to do so is going to lead to some kind of danger or um, harm in the end. I also felt like just thinking about the connective tissue between the two books that there's a very like late Freud spirit to quick fixes. Um, Like I found Hmm. myself thinking, in fact, um, that, that, that the sort of like shadow title of the book would be something like palliative measures, like that famous bit in uh, <laughs> Civilization yeah. and its Discontents where Freud is like, life is it's too hard for us. We need palliative measures. And one of the things he says is like, well, we need drugs, we need substances. Um, so it is that sort of like late post-death drive Freud in, in some ways, it feels like, that animates You know, I wish book. I had talked to you, Abby, before uh, coming up with the book title, because Quick Fixes was kind of a late edition. Uh, we, we just weren't sure what the title was, was going to be, and Quick Fixes worked in a lot of ways, but I was very sort of squeamish about it until the very end. I like palliative measures. It does get to like a, a portion of what the, the book is about, which is that at least t- today, or today in particular, um, it's difficult not to see escalating drug consumption across the board as somehow related to the the, the decaying and very fragile state of, of American society. Yeah. I mean, so that gives me a good good segue to ask you to perform a sort of impossible task, which is, can you sketch out for our listeners a little bit about the history of drug use in the U.S., um, including uh, something that really comes through in the book, which is American exceptionalism yeah. with regard to drug consumption. It, it occurs to me here, if I could just piggyback on this and, yeah. and, and gloss something that came up earlier, you have a line fairly late in the book uh, defining sort of what the quick fix is or why the quick fix is the as a motif or end title for the text. And and you write, drugs both conjure, conjure a, normal, a unique Americanism, the quick fix, anything that covers over that allows for some resumption of, quote, normalcy that prevents a full reckoning, that's been the stuff for us for over a full century. Yeah, just want to throw that in there. Yeah. yeah, so just to riff on uh, the title for a minute, um, I mean, uh, both that um, drugs themselves are a quick fix, right? That drugs um, do work for us, uh, that provides uh, some kind of solution, but might take the place of work or working through or some kind of longer fix. Um, I also mean that drug policy has also served as a quick fix that um, in various ways, um, drug policy throughout uh, most of American history has been a convenient way of dealing with certain social problems without naming them as such and oftentimes sort of covering them over. Um, so, yeah, so in, in both senses, uh, on both the side of sort of drug enthusiasm and drug prohibitionism, um, drugs kind of, kind of provide that quick fix. And j- just because uh, some some people have um, faulted me for doing a disservice to drugs, I should say that quick fixes are all, they're they're often really great fixes. They're terrific fixes a lot of the times. You know, anyone who has gone on YouTube and searched for home improvement repairs knows that a quick fix is a real (laughs) fix. Sometimes it's the fix you need. Um, I think the question of the book is just, 
you know, how many quick fixes can you stitch together and still have a viable structure? But yeah, so the history, uh, you know, we are uh, today Americans in the midst of this world historic drug binge. Uh, I think we comp- comprise roughly uh, four to five percent of the world's population, but we consume 80 percent of its opioids. We consume a bit more than 80 um, percent of its ADHD medications, you know, amphetamines and amphetamine like drugs. And um, I, 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 I include a, a, a table of this in the um in the uh, appendix of the book, uh, but I chart drug use consumption trends over time. And if you look in the 21st century, basically every metric of drug consumption is through the roof. So the opioid crisis is uh, the most familiar part of this, but um, really you name it, benzodiazepines, uh, marijuana, amphetamines, antidepressants, antipsychotics, all are at um, historic highs in terms of their usage, uh, even you know compared to sort of the post-war highs. Uh, and all are going up in their usage as well, um, with the notable exception of cocaine, actually, uh, which we could maybe talk about later. Um, at the same time, the U.S. has the largest uh, prison system in the world. We've got a full one-fifth of prisoners in for nonviolent drug offenses. So it's this really unique paradox. You know, we have this intense love-hate affair with drugs, and it, it is particularly acute as of late, but to get to some of the history, you know, we, we've kind of been this way for well over a century. Um, just thinking casually about the history of psychoactive drugs, really all of the important reference points are centered in the U.S. So it's Americans that drove the cocaine boom of the 70s and 80s. It's the American counterculture that's most associated with the psychedelic moment in the 60s. Um, in in the post-war era, uh, benzodiazepines, amphetamines, barbiturates, these were all uh, fully normalized drugs. Um, and then even going back to, um, uh, you know, the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, we had this enormous patent medicine industry, you know, some 50,000 uh, proprietary nostrums on the market at the time. And this was this was a moment when you could walk into any pharmacy and get medically pure heroin, cocaine, chloral hydrate, just basically anything that was available. And it was pretty, pretty cheap. Um, so th- th- this 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 paradox of like intense drug consumption combined with an intense drug prohibitionism, it sort of defined America for over a century. The intro has a bunch of what you call orienting claims. And and one of the ones that I find the most clarifying at the outset of the book is you say drug policy isn't really about drugs. Um, And as I was making my way through the book, it feels like this is even a broader claim, like drug, this is true um, also of drug discourse as well as of drug policy. So like drugs are never just about drugs is like, like I was reading this book um, and I was saying to Patrick because I started it before he did. And I was like, this is, I was like, drugs aren't about drugs. Like drugs, drugs are never just about drugs. Um, So it's always about something other than just like the phenomenological experience of being on drugs. And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what some of these other things are that we are talking about or not talking about when we talk about drugs, um, whether that's in terms of anxieties, projections, taboos, um, with respect to race, gender, class. Um, I guess put a different way, like what does drug discourse allow us to do, whether directly or obliquely? Um, And can we also talk a little bit about those experiences of being on drugs? Because I think that is important also. That's not something that you don't deal with in, in the book. In fact, like I, I was yeah. saying before, there's like a f- kind of fundamental fantasy of each drug and it involves, mm-hmm. I think, the like, what does it do to and for you? Anyway, that's a bunch of questions. <laughs> at once. Yeah, I mean, it's mainly um, a uh, history um, of, of different drugs, but I do, I do try in each chapter to get to the phenomenological experience um, for, for people who might not have had experience with with. Um, the various drugs I talk about, and I, I do so obliquely in some ways, but um, try 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 to do something to capture uh, capture the experience. Uh, but I think that you're right in general. There there's a kind of bait and switch in the book. You know, it's it's on the surface, it's very much about drugs. It's organized by chapter, by drug or class of drugs. Uh, but at, at another level, it's not at all about drugs. And um, and I was uh, interested throughout in the kinds of social conditions that um, drug use reflect. Uh, rather than than necessarily like the drugs themselves, and you know, I mean, for for all of the the, the neuroscientific 
um, chatter that's usually trotted out to describe the effects of drugs on our lives. We, I think we've really only learned one reliable thing about drugs, which is that under certain circumstances, they allow us to have better experiences than not. That, that's basically it. That's the sum of our drug knowledge uh, that's at work, at play, in casual conversations, in stressful environments. We like our experience on drugs better than not, and that's sort of why we take them. Um, but if we accept that, then I think all of the interesting follow-up questions kind of have to do well with, with what kind of experience we're having. You know, what stressors exist in society? What are the sources of anxiety and depression? What kinds of expectations are we trying to live up to? Um, what kinds of miseries are we attempting to cope with? You know, th these are some of the questions I try to deal with in relationship to drug use. Um, but I think you're right that there's this similar uh, move when it comes to drug policy and drug discourse more broadly. So when we're when we're talking about drugs, when there's public discourse about drugs, we're almost always talking about something else. And um, I just just because I've been thinking about it recently, I've got an article up in the Point magazine uh, just yesterday about the amphetamine shortage that we're going through right now. And I think this has come across pretty clearly in that story. You know, I, I think that as I understand the mechanics of it, the amphetamine shortage is pretty cut and dry. You know, there were these like kind of shady telemed startups that that uh, that were were started over over COVID. Um, they they were shut down, but you know, DEA quotas haven't caught up to sort of ramp up amphetamine production, and so we're just in this this sort of regulatory bottleneck. I think it'll soon be fixed. I think already sort of amphetamine supplies are, are going up. But if you look at the discourse about the amphetamine shortage, it's not discussed in these sort of basic ways, right? It's sort of, it's almost blown up into a culture war issue with you've got people on the right saying that, oh, you know, all these, um, these young people need to grow up and learn to deal with reality as it is. And then you've got a reaction from people on the liberal left lamenting the great deal of suffering that's being caused um, this is, this is a function of course, of just the polarized environment. Everything is sucked into the, the partisan culture war. Um, but it's also, I think a reflection of the fact that amphetamines speak to broader social pressures in a very competitive environment at work and school and whatnot. And when, when people talk about amphetamines, just, you know, a drug that helps us do things in particular shortage today, um, they're, they're talking about broader, broader social issues, even though the, the discourse is focused on amphetamines. Um, I guess just one last thing to, to mention in this connection, um, I, I offer in that section that you mentioned, Abby, uh, there's this quote from John Ehrlichman. Uh, he's one of, uh, Nixon's advisors. And, oh, yeah, uh, this was classic, brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. Oh, it's, yeah. no, it's, it's a shocking quote. It's totally shocking quote. I think that he, I mean, he revealed this like later in life. I think it was the 1990s. He was, uh, doing an interview with the journalist Dan Baum, mm. uh, about, about that era and I'm paraphrasing now, but he said something like this. He's like, look, who are our political enemies? Well, it was black people in the new left. You can't make it illegal to be black. You can't make it illegal to be on the left. So what can you do? You can demonize certain drugs. You can associate those groups with drugs. And then you can harm both indirectly through drug policy. And you read that and you're like, whoa, that's, that's a lot. You know, it's horrifying uh, in one sense, but I think that in a way, he's just kind of telling us what we already know, which is that when people legislate against drugs, they're almost always legislating against something else. And usually they're legislating against particular people associated with that, with, with those drugs. So if you go back through history, legislating against um, opium in the 19th century, cocaine in the 1910s, marijuana in the 1930s, psychedelics in the 60s, all of the crack in the 80s, of course. Mm -hmm. In all of these episodes, um, particular marginalized social groups were in the crosshairs with dr with drug legislation, even though the drugs were what was on the surface level. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that to me renders really clear some of the seemingly arbitrariness of our drug laws. Yeah, yeah this idea that they um, they. Yeah, you have this line that the drug laws, much like drug policy, treat symptoms rather than underlying causes, right? And I think that that is is extremely powerful and it, it among other things uh clarifies sort of your i think excellent decision to include entirely illicit drugs and sort of white collar drugs alongside quote unquote street drugs or sort of taboo like like gray market black market type drugs and i think there's what i found myself thinking about in all this too was both the specific sort of 
uh, racial, ethnic, gendered categories that kind of underwrite a lot of these, well, let's call them what they are, these logics of displacement or these kind of like um, manifest versus latent kind of operations where it's like, well, we need to deal with the the scourge of quote unquote urban crime as caused by the crack academic. Well, what we really mean is, you know, we're black people having access to cocaine, right? right, And, 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 and sort of the, the ensemble of things that are associated with that particular period of urban poverty and violence, which we will put on both them and while well, invoking the drug market to do it, right? Without getting too much into that, though, in the specifics of it, I found myself, in addition to contemplating the sort of, again, those specific drugs and um, specific categories of persons that are, you know, behind various sort of drug panics, I found myself thinking about the the relationships to like ideas of pleasure or of people having access to pleasure as being germane mm-hmm. here. Yeah. And there was that yeah. wonderful line that you quote from uh, I, uh, Alistair McIntyre, the conservative philosopher. Yeah. Is not really my cup of tea, but it's an amazing one about <laughs> cannabis, right? In 67, where I think it's the, uh, the issue is, is, as he puts it, is not that for people who believe that cannabis is, is bad, it's not that they actually think it's harmful, but rather they have, quote, a horrifying suspicion that here is a source of pure pleasure, which is available for those who have not earned it and do not yeah. deserve it, which seems to be like a real libidinal economic orientation that both relates to, but also is somewhat distinct from specific demonization of specific categories of persons. Yeah, undeserving pleasure. Uh, that's sort of what's behind, I, I would say, a lot of the, the, the sort of uh, motivating uh, force behind prohibitionism. Um, and I think this most this comes across maybe most clearly in uh, what's really a founding episode, I think, for this this sort of nexus of like um, drugs, race, and prohibition, which is the late nineteenth century yellow peril, and specifically around the Chinese opium den. The worry there was that you had this demasculating, uh, demasculinating, if that's a word, uh, like like uh, the, these pleasure dens where men would go and become weak and groveling and lose all interest in, you know, work, family, and God. Um, that underlying fear has sort of been with us from the late 19th century. I would say that it's not, it's not necessarily the only fear that um, motivates the drug prohibitionists. There's also, you know, very different ideas about drugs making us superhuman monsters uh that's that's evident as well so not just the sort of like weak groveling opium user but the sort of like superhuman pcp or crack giant uh that's sort of uh d- described in a lot of news stories from the 80s about crack for instance um so th- there's various underlying fantasies to drug prohibitionism and it's always um it's always helpful to have someone like mcintyre spell them out one of the things that strikes me also um and i think is connected to some of this is And it's really a feature of your book that, I I mean, I don't know, I've I've read other histories of uh, like psychopharmacology in America or or the history of psychopharmacology in general. And you usually see these sharp distinctions between like recreational drugs and prescribed drugs. And we also then often get the sort of like idea of like medication versus self-medication. And I think you collapse those distinctions uh, pretty much Entirely, maybe maybe not the, the the self-medication one, but can you talk a little bit about the decision to treat like drugs like on block without making that as a sharp distinction? Yeah, in, in some ways it was an arbitrary distinction. So when I when I started the book, the constraining factor was I was going to talk about anything, any kind of psychoactive drug, any mm-hmm. kind of psychoactive medication. Okay, and um. In some ways, this is arbitrary because you could include a lot of other interesting things in the book. For a while, I thought maybe about including chapters on the behavioral addictions. So um, like new conceptions around sex addiction or Mm. gambling addiction or social media addiction, um, all of which tie into into the moment quite quite well. I also was was like maybe interested in non-psychoactive drugs as well, because those are always the the big sort of bestsellers for the pharmaceutical industry, you know, arthritis medication, um, cholesterol medication, the the various things marketed to an aging population that make pharmaceutical companies a lot of money. Sure. Um, But but I limited it to psychoactive drugs um, because I felt like enough work could be done just in that category alone. And as you say, there's typically this rigid line drawn between uh, the licit and the illicit, um, like legal medications versus like illegal recreational drugs. I mean, I guess there's a lot of legal recreational drugs as well, but we tend to, 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 
to throw up barriers between these things. Um, and, and in some ways those are justified, you know, just, just the, the regulatory mechanisms that govern, um, these different drugs mean that the experiences of using them are going to be quite disparate, no matter how similar pharmacologically the drugs are. So yeah. drugs that are regulated by the FDA and taken licitly, they're going to provide a certain experience that drugs, um, you know, uh, targeted by the DEA and, uh, you know, made, made illegal and made difficult to procure and made, uh, they, they make it so that you have to take them under difficult circumstances with dirty routes of administration and so on and so forth. That's obviously going to produce a very different, different experience, even though sometimes the drugs being used in these situations are quite similar chemically. I think at, at the end of the day, though, when drugs are used in a medical setting versus when they're used in a recreational setting, they're not necessarily used for radically different purposes. And that's mm -hmm. why I felt sort of comfortable talking about them them together. I do want to um, do justice to the distinctiveness of, of each drug in the book. And that's why I split up the material by drug. I think the kinds of stories that we can tell about America through the lens of uh, amphetamines is obviously very different from that that, uh, that we tell through the story through the lens of opiates. Um, but at the same time, I, I wanted to break down some of those boundaries because um, that rigid line between licit and illicit, medical and recreational, um, I, I don't think it does uh, much of a service to our understanding of of our historic levels of drug consumption today. Yeah, I'm just I'm kind of free associating here, but but the the drug or not drug, but set of drugs, let's say class of drugs that comes to mind when you're, when you're talking about it in this way, um, that's changing so rapidly in terms of its classification is the psychedelics. So I'm thinking about, um, MDMA, I'm thinking about psilocybin, thinking about LSD. It feels to me like you're making the case in your book that we are really soon going to be seeing like the psychedelics, like, and not just like in the horizon, but like in the next few years, um, psychedelic therapy as, as the thing that is going to be replacing SSRIs and, and other sort of like antidepressants is, am I overstating that? Or is that the kind of vision that, that you have? No, that's, that's very much the one, uh, clear prediction that I make in the book. I, in, in general, uh, shy away from making predictions. I actually wanted to include some more material about like Biden and marijuana legalization, but I was mm. like, this is going to be immediately out of date. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I just cut it from the book. Um, and, and in general, you know, I think that given how closely um, patterns of drug consumption, prohibitionism are tied to different changes in capitalist society, I'm reticent to predict the future given that, um, you know, no one, what, no one knows what comes after the neoliberal period. It's cratering in various ways, uh, but it's a very uncertain time. And I think so too is the future of, of drug use in America. That being said, I think that we're kind of on a, uh, um, we've, we've got a kind of path dependency when it comes to psychedelics in a lot of ways. A lot of things are in motion that make it seem like um, MDMA first and then psilocybin, LSD, maybe other um, other drugs as well will soon be legal um, medications that therapists yeah. can use in their practice. Uh, MDMA, I think it was scheduled uh, to be approved by the FDA in 2023. From what I've heard, that's been pushed back to the first quarter of 2024. Uh, but it's imminent. Um, you know, it's it's coming. It could become a kind of political football if Biden decides that it's, it should be. Um, but I'm guessing that sometime early in 2024, it will be. And, you know, there's there's good reason to believe that the uh, the trajectory of marijuana will be repeated with that of psychedelics. You know, mm. when when medical marijuana first came along, there was a lot of lamentation about the hypocrisy of it. You know, and I was I lived in California for a bit and pretty easy to get like a medical card. Um, there was a kind of state sanctioned hypocrisy almost about medical marijuana, um, but it did its work. You know, unlike the, unlike the seventies reform movements, which all failed um, the hypocrisy of legal of, of medical marijuana, at least opened the door and proved to a lot of people, this is not the dangerous drug that you might've heard about from previous generations. It's fine. It's in fact, one of the most safe, it's one of the safest drugs in existence um, and in, in many ways, the medical marijuana movement paved the way for the recreational marijuana movement that it, that, it, that it proved to a lot of people that it's fine, that this is not something about which we should we should be causing human suffering. 
I could see something ha- similar happening with psychedelics. Um, it, I mean, in like major liberal urban centers, it's it's kind of already happening. You know, sure. you can get psilocybin laced chocolate bars like from from people. It's this new leisure recreational sort of subculture is already being created. I could see it going much more mainstream, but you know, like uh, maybe a decade down the road, uh, I think the medical moment would have to be fully uh, in place first before, before we see that. But I met someone the other day who, uh, this is in Seattle, who wanted to uh, start a a nightclub uh, where no alcohol was served, but you just had different sort of drinks with psychedelic combinations. So, you, you know, you go in, you, you order some, proprietary combination of 2CB and psilocybin instead of a beer. It's pretty wild. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen anytime <laughs> soon, but I think it's interesting that people are already thinking in that direction. My, my two thoughts on this, these are, these are both a little bit frivolous, but one, the insurance situation for a business like that is going to be a <laughs> fucking mess. And two, talk about like structures of prohibition and desire kind of operating in uh tandem or I guess like dialectical relationship. It occurs to me that a a club where you just get, well, club drugs, but there's no alcohol would basically produce of necessity an illicit alcohol business on site, much in the same way as every (laughs) club that's all about alcohol also includes people working the floor in cooperation with management to sell you illicit drugs. It just feels like it, one is going to yield the other somehow of necessity. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, absolutely. And in, in a way, um, I mean, there's also a, a really burgeoning non-alcoholic beverage market as yeah. well. And so th- there's this desire um, amongst many parts of the population for something other than alcohol, I guess, to organize our social experience. And there's, it feels like that's part of it that for so long alcohol has been the social glue. It's been the yeah. thing that people go out to do to socialize. And um, it, there, there's, there's a real reaction against that. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, you could imagine uh, a similar kind of place serving both psychedelic cocktails and alcohol as well. But I, I think it's interesting that he's like, no, we're, we're not going to go that particular route. And so there's a, there's a kind of reaction in new forms of poly drug use to the the central place of alcohol in in American society. Something that's a term that seems germane here is 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 like about personal experience or or like solitary atomized experience versus communal ones. And I'm just thinking about mm-hmm. this in relation to to one. Actually, I just was, just finished, spent this morning listening to the excellent Friends of the Pod Know Your Enemy episode about the Grateful Dead, where they're talking about like the politics of the dead. Right? There are actually a lot of deadheads who are very right wing. Tucker Carlson being like another example. It's the second time he's come up in this episode. Right? They love the dead for some reason, right? They, they, they see it as libertarian, et cetera. And one of the speculations that Matt, Sam, and their guests were talking about is that looking, you go to a dead concert, you're probably on drugs, right? You know, even if you, and Coulter says she never, she, she, she passes the joint supposedly, which is fucking bullshit, but whatever. At a certain point, these experiences are of collective effervescence, but then, you know, it's, um, it's a 20 minute, jam of uncle john's band so like you can't not experience that individually these are hard things to do collectively right and and in a similar vein i'm thinking about and i don't think like the down like the pub or the bar is like necessarily the only way we can envision sociality but there is something about the turn towards experiences that cannot necessarily be shared or to experiences that are first and foremost individual and that involves some degree of dissociation from other people or from experience. And, and the analysis that I'm thinking of here that's germane is, is that of, our, of my friend Malcolm Harris, right, who's read a great deal about drugs. And one of the things that he sort of notes about cannabis in particular is the uh, trend away from, from people smoking it. Right. The idea oh, yeah. that like, like a joint is a, I mean, this was part of the line too, part of the credentialism sort of legitimacy stuff vis-a-vis the DEA. Like we don't smoke our medicine was one of the lines we always, we, we'd hear a lot. That's why we can't legalize. Uh, but also just the fact that now like people don't pass joints. Instead, you, 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 you hit your little pen and move on. And like, it, it's deliberately not shared and not social. And then I, I even, and this is the last thing that just, again, kind of blew my mind to realize people are, are, are now hitting DMT off vape pens too, which makes me never want to borrow anyone's vape pen ever again. Cause the <laughs> idea of going on what I guess they call a 20 minute business trip sounds like psychosis in hell. But again, there's just something about this atomized thing where like there's nothing to pass around. Yeah. I mean, it's not that, it's not that alcohol is an inherently social drug by any means. There's, you can do social things with other drugs um, but alcohol has been the the thing that has organized social experience in America for 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 so long, and um, you know I, I should say that um, I think that you're right to, to say that there there is a trend from 
uh, the more social experiences of drug use towards more atomized, individualized forms. Um, there is something not uh, bad about that for like better description. So, uh, you know, if you read um, uh, accounts of like walking into a tavern in the early 19th century, uh, you know, it, it's a kind of t- a terrifying environment. Uh, you know, you walk in, you had better, you know, buy drinks for people, you had better reciprocate, you'd better, you know, get along with everyone. And there's there's one line from one account that says, like, when you walk into a bar in America, it's literally stranger, will you drink or will you fight? <laughs> um, and it's sort of, you know, the frat house, uh, excess is the frat house life, but writ large, like all over all over the country. And um, it's terrifying in one sense, but I do think it, it it speaks to just the intense social obligation that was bound up in drinking. Yeah. Right. It wasn't it wasn't about drinking. Once again, drugs not being about drugs. It wasn't about drinking. It's whether or not you're going to be part of this social group that you're entering right. into. And if you're not going to drink, you're showing yourself to be out of line with that with that sociality um, that we don't have to do that anymore in general, I think is probably a good thing. And so, you know, moving away from that, some of that sort of gift exchange mentality of, um, of the tavern, probably a good thing. But at the same time, the trend towards uh, ever more atomized uses of drugs, um, you know, away from social drug experiences and toward very personalized, almost like curated individual environments. Um, that's, that's kind of terrifying as well. So sure, surely we can find some middle ground there. I mean, I also want to push back a little bit, not not towards you, Ben, but, but towards the idea of sort of like social drugs versus like the curated personal experience. That, mm. And again, I'm thinking about um, psychedelics and dissociatives, um, but particularly psychedelics, which, you know, mostly it's like you're on your own trip, right? Um, and especially the way that we're now thinking about psychedelics, um, and bracketing the sort of um, microdose to be, you know, better and more productive kind of usage. But, you know, you were talking before, like egos are good things are also kind of scary, right? Mm. Which I agree with, (laughs) need them, but also kind of scary. But uh, psychedelics are also about ego death. They're also about like understanding yourself as fundamentally like part of the universe. Um, You know, so I I do see, I I think we can have, we can jump too fast to the sort of like alcohol is this thing that brings us together just because it has historically been a way that we organize ourselves. When you think about these other, these other things that might be used, generally speaking, in, in smaller groups or in a solitary way, but are actually, you know, potentially something that can lead you towards a sort of reorganization of, say, your political beliefs about the importance of togetherness. Yeah, I mean, I I think that uh, just because alcohol has served that social function does not at all mean that it is the thing that should should serve it. Uh, In fact, I think probably, you know, this emerging... Um, you know, subculture around poly drug use is a new way to uh, organize social experience. Um, you know, it's it's very praiseworthy in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, you can certainly bring up all sorts of other drugs. Cocaine comes to mind that yeah. organize social experience in, in ways that, that alcohol like, differs from. But, you know, with, with psychedelics, I think that I think in many ways, the psychedelic moment is most interesting, not just because of, of all the different sort of new developments and that it's soon probably going to be medically legal, uh, or at least MDMA and psilocybin very soon. Um, but also because it, it, it speaks to the kind of, um, brutal instrumental instrumentalization yeah. of drug use today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So a, as you say, I mean, psychedelics, they, they potentially bring us to the outer bounds of, of human consciousness, right. To the point where total ego death is a temporary possibility, uh, in both a horrifying and a sort of curative way. Yeah. But what are they being used for in a lot of parts of the country today? They're being used by Silicon Valley tech bros to like go to their parties and have more fun. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it's wild. I mean, we've taken drugs that are potentially quite liberatory and instrumentalized them. They've yeah. turned them into sort of replacement amphetamines almost. There seems to be something. I think a through line here is to is a type of uh, you described it as developing a free relationship or perhaps a more free relationship or in any event, a critical relationship to the fantasies that underwrite what we want drugs to do or what we imagine drugs to do. And this seems to particularly cash out in these ideas of 
liberatory potential, but also of just the social formations that, that, that come up to being around them. So the, it, to refer back to the thing we were just talking about, this animization and certain types of like individually catered experiences, as you both were talking, I found myself being like, all right, they have a point here. Uh, there a lot of the sociology, the sociality surrounding some of the drugs that like we, we might say think was cool or quaint is actually incredibly fucking annoying or even toxic, right? Like the fact that like the guy that you're buying weed from, you have to, he has to show up at your house and you have to pretend to be his friend and he's going to tell you about something that's going to be so fucking innate. And you're like, dude, just, I want to make this, like, it's much easier to go to the dispensary, buy something, put a couple bucks in a dip and then we got done, right? But, but also yeah. the sociality that's like hanging on these, dream, the liberatory dreams as, as you talk about of um, psychedelics. And I, I think here about, the fact that, and you make a very strong case for this, and I think we think there's some research. I think we'll put uh, a bunch of books. I think there's that book, lovely book, Psychedelic Whiteness, and then there's that paper about pluripotentiality of psychopharmacology uh, drugs that's, that's germane here. But like all the data that seems to suggest that people may not necessarily have radical experiences of critical like ego death or of like put, draw any political conclusions whatsoever, and in fact may just double down on the political experiences or orientations mm-hmm. that they had going into it. So like you have sure. someone who like you give the proud yeah. boy a bunch of like ketamine or something, and then you wait for him to come back and like tell you that you're being of light when instead he's like, no, 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 I'm just into esoteric Hitlerism now. Right. Like I'm into the occult stuff. And it's like, so it it just leads you to, even in these dissociated or deranged states, you lead to what you take to be the basic aspects or building blocks of the universe. And if for for you, those are things like irreducible racial difference or like the the desire to bring on Kali Yuga, you're going to go on to that too. Like that, that's just going to be what's there. You, You brought it in with you. Yeah, I mean, just quickly about marijuana, when when it was first legalized in California, I just imagined all Californian weed smokers celebrating that they no longer had to deal with that awkward guy anymore. <laughs> they could just go to a store. Finally, they could just go to a store. I'll pay double just as long as they don't have to deal with that guy. Yeah, you know, this is another way in which we so, sometimes um, hope for drugs to do things for us that we have to do by by other means. Um, you know, dr- drugs are um, sometimes, uh, I mean, certainly in the psychedelic counterculture of the sixties, that was a hope, right? The hope was that LSD could cure us of our hangups in such a way as so that everyone could participate in the revolution. Um, and I think that, um, I think that in a lot of ways, the contemporary psychedelic moment, it's, um, as I said, brutally instrumental in one sense, very professionalized and curated. So they do not want to repeat the disasters of the sixties in any way. Um, but, but at the same time, I think that they, they understand that, you know, this is not, this is not a liberatory kind of experience. It's something that can be personally quite curative, but it's not necessarily going to, um, lead to some kind of political evolution whereby the the structures of contemporary society are changed. One thing you do in the book, which is, I think, very admirable and, and really astute, is you relate sort of these different periods and what we could call political economy to like different starring drugs of the moment or like different fantasies of what drugs are, right? And so whether it's the the Fordist, Keynesian, mother's little helper, uh, dad having to deliver a position, deliver a presentation at whatever that madman office is, right? And does he need Valium or does she need amphetamines, right? Or, and that's then succeeded by other things, right? Other changes. Um, and that, and in the neoliberal turn, you, 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 you very much situate cocaine as like the perfect drug. Like that's like the drug for neoliberalism is, is I take your yeah, book saying. Absolutely. And I, I, w- I know we can, maybe gloss what neoliberalism is for some people if they need to think about this, but I'm like, that just struck me as being very, very true. Something about the idea of like, well, what a neoliberal economist might call if they're talking about the financialized housing market, irrational exuberance, right? Or, or, or like total confidence. And, and that seems to be very much at play in cocaine. So could we just talk about either Coke specifically or Coke in the neoliberal moment or drugs in neoliberalism, if that's all right? And by the way, the opening yep. of the Coke chapter is hilarious. Yes. And we yeah. did do a dramatic reading of it. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Uh, the, the, I mean, it, cocaine, it, it is remarkable. Uh, so again, to, to refer to the, the first appendix of the book, I try to compress all um, psychoactive drug use trends over time into like one chart. 
Uh, and it's a, it's it's very confusing in some ways. But the most remarkable feature of that to me is that after the Controlled Substances Act in 1970, when you get a uh, cratering in, in, in marijuana use, amphetamine use, benzodiazepine use, all this stuff, you just see the trend line for cocaine going the exact other way. It's just shooting up as the trends for all these other drugs are going down. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, you know, when we get to the 21st century, as all other drugs es- begin escalating uh, in use, cocaine drops to historic lows in use and it hasn't recovered. So there, there's been a lot of speculation. There's this one article called Uncle Sam's Cocaine Nosedive um, and trying to make sense of this. And, and you know, we're, we're not not really sure, but um, it, it's really remarkable. It is the drug of neoliberalism. It's the it's the perfect drug drug for neoliberalism. It's that jolt of efe- ephemeral, irrational confidence that we all needed to get through the moment. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that there are different stressors that exist in American society at different periods that lead to different ideas, uh, whether it's temperance or drug enthusiasm or new sort of like pharmaceutical ad copy. And so I, I I try to be careful about parsing the sort of underlying um, imperatives and stressors by historical period. Um, but I, I think the red thread that runs throughout them and and kind of the reason why Americans in general uh, and sort of been this way for, for a century, the, the reason that we are kind of unique amongst denizens of other industrialized countries is that I think we're kind of uniquely subject to the predations of capitalist society. Mm-hmm. There aren't um, there aren't really countervailing forces or structures to mitigate the effects of the market. And this is true in a lot of, you know, more particular senses. So uh, America and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that allow direct to consumer advertising. Those pharmaceutical ads that you see on television, those don't exist in most parts of the world. And I think probably for good reason. So we're preyed upon in these specific senses, but I mean this in a much more general sense. You know, we don't have workers' parties. We don't have labor labor parties. We don't have a history of them. We've got weak and segmented unions, decaying associational life more broadly, certainly afraid and sometimes non-existent social safety net. And in all these ways, with the absence of these countervailing forces, the kinds of things that would provide some modicum of um, of, of personal or social security in America... I basically think that we're prone to, you know, excessive moralizing about drugs and excessive medication at the same time. And so I sort of see drug enthusiasm and drug prohibitionism in the book as two sides of the same coin. You know, it's it's ways in which we uh, cope with these seemingly intransigent social structures like we adapt, we cope, we we take the quick fix. Um, And, you know, Patrick, you mentioned a second ago that the sort of free relation, that's sort of where I end up in the conclusion. You know, we've been subject to this sort of twin drug prohibitionism, drug peddling for well over a century. And rather than go one way or the other, I think we, what we should hope from the moment is that we begin to gain a freer relationship to the kinds of drugs we take, not just, you know, medically pure versions of them with safe routes of administration, and safe environments to take them, uh, but also, you know, uh, less stress like less compulsions to use drugs. Um, and if we can create that kind of situation, you know, we might, st- we, we will still take drugs, but doing so in a, in a freely chosen fashion, I think that's what we should hope for. You know what the free relation to drugs section reminded me of, and this is like a, a little bit of a deep cut and Ben, maybe a callback to, to, to grad school for, for both of us is, um, you know, we usually on this podcast were like the 20th century is inaugurated by the interpretation of dreams, which comes out in 1900. But so does William James's Variety's Religious Experience. And there's that passage there. And, and you know, forgive me, it's been a while since I've revisited it. But he's talking, if I believe, if I if I remember correctly, about nitrous. Mm-hmm. And, and it, the phrase is something just like, and I realize that like the kind of consciousness that we're in normally is just one of the many mm. that we could be in. And, and, you know, it's lovely and lyrical and, you know, all too idealistic, mm. but what it really does convey is this, this sense of a non-moralistic relation to the idea that we could, we could take substances to just discover something else, right? That that's a, it's a non-instrumental relation to like the self and substances. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that that's what should be hoped for in a lot of ways to de-instrumentalize our relationship to drugs. 
Um, and I, I think it's the same, it's the same book where James describes the more, yeah, the, yeah. Our, our desire for the more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there's something, there's something in that about, you know, in the American experience as well, that like we, we do desire to be kind of taken in. Like we want to find that yeah. thing that provide happiness and meaning and fulfillment and whatnot. Um, but, but the way in which that desire for the more is parsed is in, you know, is in a society where we are sort of open out on the market where, uh, and as a result, where we are sort of committed paranoids about engaging yeah. with the things that would, that might provide us that more. Yeah. You know? uh, and so there's, there's a real ambivalence there. Like we want it, but um, at the same time, uh, we, we know that we're being preyed upon in various ways by our desire for it. Yeah, we're being taken in in the negative sense. Yeah. Yep. Have you read uh, have you, or, or seen uh, Mike Wallace's and Carmen Belosa's book, Narco, His, uh, Narco History? I'm not sure I have, actually, yeah. It's really good. It's a, it's a solid audio book, too. But but uh, it, she's a Mexican journalist, and I think he may be married and is an American journalist. But what they, mm. it, it's a from Mexico perspective on the 80s and 90s and, the, mm. the, and, and on the emergence of the quote-unquote cartels, right? And her claim, which is, I, I found incredibly clarifying is that essentially the 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 intensifications that we associate with the, the the revamped coke trade right in the 80s and then the meth stuff right is the result of a collapse of what were essentially fordist keynesian style relationships between the mexican state and the part and the pri i think the party um over coke production mm. the the crackdown on that, which was in effect a deregulation and under the yeah. guise of, de- of, of corruption, like the anti-corruption stuff, producing cartels, which are, she says, are actually sort of a signifier for thoroughly neoliberalized, cooperative, and yes, uh, competitive, but also deeply corrupt, like, responses mm-hmm. to the collapse of the broader Fordist Keynesian project in general. So, so, like, the network that produces the coke is itself neoliberal and comes about understood as a result of neoliberal processes. And I just thought that was like completely germane. To- That's really interesting. Um, uh, th- there's, uh, I've been, um, I've been wanting to return to some of the material and parse it in, in different ways. And uh, I was um, thinking just about like looking at deinstitutionalization more broadly mm-hmm. and sort of like what it meant for uh, the liberalization of drug laws this is especially apparent in tobacco. Like at the, at the, point when American consumption of, of cigarettes is taking a nosedive in the 80s, uh, a lot of, of the sort of trade liberalization around uh, about around big tobacco uh, happened by crushing state monopolies on tobacco in, you know, Thailand or like East Asia, so that you could just like allow like consumption to rise. And it's these state monopolies and state production and state distribution channels that actually curbed a lot of, of, of smoking. And uh, once those were crushed, like, you know, like big tobacco cigarettes just sort of flooded the countries. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's an interesting story to be told there about a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, de-escalating state functions that allowed, you know, drug use to to open up in the neoliberal period. A little while ago, you were talking about drug ads, right? And that the United States and New Zealand are the only places where, where these are allowed. And one of the things that your book includes is classic advertisements for for various historical drugs uh, which are wild like it's not an exaggeration to say that some are basically like are you anxious by how the cold war and the prospect of nuclear annihilation hangs over your head is being a housewife in levittown sapping your energy or driving you up the wall do you want a drug to make the 1970s more manageable than the 60s i mean so they're like they're definitely saying the quiet part out loud right and so what i wanted to ask is Against this backdrop, can you say a little bit about how you understand the biomedical turn since the development of the DSM-3 as mystifying these social problems? So what does it mean that drug ads and pharmacological discourse now are so characterized by technical descriptions and these almost like pedagogical gestures, you know, talk to your doctor about this new drug that adjusts the balance of serotonin, an important chemical in your brain. You know, so like what explanatory relief does this approach provide on the one hand, but also what what sort of social or political consciousness does it foreclose on the other? Yeah, it's a big question. Um, the process of finding uh, those advertisements was definitely one of the more um, insane 
moments of, of writing the book. Uh, I, I think at some, at one point I had checked out like a hundred uh, bound copies of years of the American Psychiatric Association's journal to just go through and look for the ads because actually interesting, this is one of the reasons why we need physical mm. archives rather than just internet archives. They eliminate all the advertisements in the oh, online versions wow. of JAMA and JAP and all the other oh. medical journals. You cannot see the actual advertisements. You have to go to the actual journals to see them. Um, yeah, just, just, you know, these things just like all over, uh, all over my place with, uh, little, little, um, bookmarks, uh, of, of ads I wanted to make copies of. And, and those ads, as you say, Abby, they're, um, horrifying in one sense. They do say the quiet part out loud. Um, but you know, they also just say something about the particular social conditions of the time. And, and that's sort of what's interesting about them. You know, that one ad about Librium that you reference. Yeah. It's like, you know, are you worried about what's going on in Cuba and Czechoslovakia? Well, Hey, just take some, take some Librium and you'll feel better about it. <laughs> um, are you miserable at work? Uh, do you hate like being in this isolating domestic cell all the time? Here's Cerax, try something else. And, and however awful the, 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 the sort of message that the ads conveys uh, is, um, the social reference is there. You know, yeah. the, basic, yeah. the basic conception is this society that we live in, it's a stressful one for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And here are some drugs to help you deal with it. Um, what's notable about the biological revolution in psychiatry is that, um, you know, it, we become kind of reductive in our explanation. So yeah. this is the time when we stop justifying drug use in reference to uh, different social imperatives and begin talking about underlying brain states, neurotransmitters and whatnot. And um, all this stuff about, you know, serotonin reuptake and adenosine receptors and whatnot that's really, uh, that's really an effect of this biological revolution. It was made possible by many things. We don't need to get into all of them. Um, but, but, but for, for my purposes, you know, the most interesting thing about this turn in psychiatry is that we begin to occlude the social reference. Yeah. So, yeah. so again, we don't, we don't take these medications because of some social stressor we're dealing with, but we, we take them to deal with some underlying brain state that the drugs help correct and I don't doubt the latter is true. You know, we are embodied beings. Um, I do think that psychiatrists are beginning to admit to have a little bit more honesty about the fact that this quest to tie mental health disorders strictly to particular actions of neurotransmitters, it's kind of, you know, um, a fool's errand in a lot of ways. Uh, it's very useful in pharmaceutical ad copy, but there's not a lot of um, science to sort of back it up. Right. Uh, and, and of course, you know, like I said, we're, we're embodied beings. Of course, the brain is going to be affected when we're going through different mental health issues. But that being said, you know, um, the problem is not just neurotransmitters. The problem is that um, the, is that uh, when we only talk about neurobiological justifications for taking different drugs, we're no longer talking either about personal histories, nor are we talking about kinds of social conditions um, that spur different kinds of drug use. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a great book by uh, Joseph Davis, I think it is, uh, Chemically Imbalanced, where he he talks about um, the new the new ways in which people describe their interiority in in the terms of pharmaceutical ad copies, yeah. essentially, right? So it's no longer the old psychoanalytic model where you're talking about your relationship to your parents or whatnot, but it's oh, you know, I have um, particular sort of. Uh, serotonin reuptake issue that this drug helps solve, right? And so the thing that was affecting me, me before, it's now no longer there. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, it helps provide some relief. I, I think that that's like drugs do provide pharmacological relief, but it's helpful to know, it's helpful to be able to, be able to point to something uh, as making sense of your experience, and I think that that's what what drugs and associated diagnoses help do. They say, here's here's the source of my problem and here is something to help me deal with it. Well, you know, that's that's helpful. It's certainly meaning making in a certain sense, but I think it includes other other ways in which we might get at those problems, other ways we might describe them and other ways we might work through them. That's I think that's that that's so important. And and this listeners to the podcast will probably hear echoes here of conversations we've had about say like the usefulness of diagnostic categories, right? Being told, well, actually this is something you are or that you have and that that becomes useful. You change certain behaviors, you reflect on certain things and that, or you have a touchstone with another community that that gives you. And that that is um, something that I think we as a pair collectively, and I think people, more people in general, like don't 
I, it's hard to have a, it's hard to have a problem with that. In fact, that that's something that can be very, very transformational for people. But it 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 does also seem to run the risk at certain times of like maybe having people like identify with impossible entities, right? Or like see themselves as being like these essential things that can't change. And it, it occurs to me in in, in relation to this, uh, how one thing that can also be occluded by the production of these new vocabularies or these new ways of talking about psychological problems or just pain, right? It yeah. is that it it not only mystifies the social conditions, but it has a way of sometimes preventing us from seeing structural repetitions in the way that pain is articulated and in the relationships of power to institutions or individual powerlessness that they configure. And here I think of, um, I think it's Alan Cron in his book, His History of Hysteria, The Elusive Neurosis, mm -hmm. right? Where he is a psychoanalyst, I think he's out of Michigan and he documents all these different, his claims like, where did the hysterics go? He walks them through certain pages. Like he says, a lot of people that were diagnosed as being, um, you know, uh, borderline in the fifties, arguably hysterics and is, is his framing of this, but where he finds hysteria now most, or at least where he proposes we could find a, a type of classical hysteria or at least hysteria qua a, like a, a relationship of, of, of passivity but also of sort of self-sabotage or of denial of enjoyment, but that also has secondary gains of relationships of, um, with doctors or with other people in your life is precisely through the language of psychopharmacology such that people will be mm -hmm. like, well, this wasn't, this wasn't really me. My, it was, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. it was my serotonin, just my dopamine wasn't working that day. And that's why I was rude to you. Right. Or you have to forgive right. me for I'm not paying attention right now. That's just the ADD. It's, and it's not like here are the things that are causing me distress or maybe activating that. And we shouldn't say that again, this, this terminology may be useful. It's not bad, but that it does have a way of making us, because it's so new and because it's always new, we can't be like, oh, this is about certain configurations of activity, passivity, the limits of right. what this person thinks they are or can be or what they've been told they can only ever be. And that all seems to be deeply familiar, almost uncannily familiar, underlying these vocabulary changes and these changes in medication. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the um, the other interesting things about the current psychedelic moment is that there is... I would say in the leading thinkers of new psychedelic therapies, a lot of pushback against this. Mm. So I, I think that a lot of a lot of trends in how how the market is developing. You know, we've got Peter Thiel out there cornering the market in synthetic psilocybin. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of new kinds of drugs uh, on the market if if this thing happens. But but all of the incentives at that level uh, are to just sort of undergird the existing model, right? So keep those same explanatory justifications, just provide different different kinds of drugs. Yeah. Right? So instead of instead of SSRIs, you get your psilocybin microdose pills that you take on a daily basis. You use the same categories, mm -hmm. um, but you just take different drugs. Right. Th th there's also this other movement uh, within the psychedelic space to push back against a lot of that stuff. And it, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it, it draws on research that was done all the way back in the 50s about different psycholytic approaches to therapy and at the time when um when therapists were using lsd or or psilocybin in therapy it was always the talking that they thought of as curative right mm -hmm. they thought of these drugs as helping along the possibility of overcoming different ego defenses so as to reach real breakthroughs in therapy um but they they didn't think of it sort of reductively in terms of brain states or different sort of like like other causative mechanisms, it was just helping. It was an adjunct to talk therapy, and and that's really being revived. You know, the uh, yeah. in in a lot of different forms. Like the hope is that we have not just different drugs to take, but that we have different kinds of uh, methods of therapy and different kinds of explanatory justifications for taking those drugs. Now, that's as I said, very much in tension with the for profit model that is in existence. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see that tension sort of play out in the coming years. I think a lot of psychedelic enthusiasts are hoping for a paradigm shift, yeah. but they're coming up against the constraints of the profit motive. We'll see how that resolves. This lovely, uh, this in a lovely way sort of cues up this quote from your last chapter, which I, if you don't mind, I wanted to read back to you, but also just, you know, for our audience first and foremost, which is don't get me wrong. Drugs, especially the ones we have today can be very powerful and pleasurable substances. But psychoactive drugs will never take the place of human relationships, though they can numb the pain of disconnection. They will never get people to think in a perfectly determinate and controllable fashion. They will never save the world. And they will never ultimately deliver on the twin promises of meaning and happiness, 
though they will often deliver quite efficiently on the promise of fun. To think that they could do any of these things, all of which raise a specter of a new form of evil and slavery that appears as a latent dream thought to the drug war's manifest lunacy, is to misunderstand both the dangers and the benefits that drugs do pose. Which seemed to state the whole matter in a lovely way, and also to be very psychoanalytic, I got to say. This is, I, I, I think every hour, like, this is a very psychoanalytic book. I mean, I don't want to put that mantle on you in a way that might be bad, but I, I think it's, in the best possible sense, it's generative in that way. No, thanks. I mean, Abby, I think you described um, drug policy earlier as arbitrary. And I, I would go even so far as to say that it's irrational, sure, that it doesn't sure. make sense, like all, just on the face of it. Um, but, you know, in psychoanalytic terms, okay, let's see this irrationality as a kind of motivated irrationality. Mm-hmm. Like, why do we get this kind of thing that I, that is not only a failure on its own terms, right? The efforts to curb drug production, distribution, consumption, they've all failed in various ways and we know why they failed. It's just kind of an impossible task. Not only that, but it's borne all sorts of other pernicious consequences. It is a huge failure. So why why do we engage in it? And, you know, I, I think that it should be mainly criticized for those those failures. But in that section of the conclusion, I try to get after like, well, what what on earth are the drug warriors so so concerned about? Mm. Right. Like, what is it that what is the root fantasy yeah, yeah. that they're trying to get at with this stuff? And um, there's a title of a book from the 70s. Uh, it, it reads something like um, uh, heroin. It's so good. Don't even try it once. <laughs> And I I think that kind of sums up the worry, right? That like drugs are too good. They're just too good that if you take them, you're going to drop out of life. You're going to be just sort of pooling around in your own tub of butter or something that we're all going to be kind of like Wally, Wally figures. (laughs) And I, 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 um, and you, you see all sorts of cultural representations of this, right? It's sort of from, from like brave new world on down that like the drugs are going to like numb us into disconnection and whatever. And um, there, there's some truth in those portrayals. I mean, <laughs> certainly the contemporary psychedelic moment has a lot to, that sort of speaks to that concern very much. And, you know, I mean, my own opinion is that these are just better drugs than psychiatrists currently have available to them. I mean, not to be too simple about it, but I, I do think whether we're just renewing the old psychiatric model or experiment, experimenting with new forms of therapy, that these drugs are going to help a lot of people um, and they're going to help them adapt to uh, a decaying society in a lot of ways as well. But but that being said, like, you know, as you said, the, the quote you just read, Patrick, I just don't think that they're, they're that, that good. They're, they're terrific substances in all sorts of ways, but we invest them with these meanings that far outstrip what they actually do. Drugs are terrific substances. I mean, I want to make that clear, like lest I be uh, mistaken for a drug moralist. They have, they're a tremendous benefit to human beings. Most people, most of the time, report positive drug experiences. They're awesome. It's just the question is, you know, what, what can they actually do for us? Right. And are we, are we reasonably thinking about both the dangers they pose and the benefits they offer? Yeah. so much this is this has been you know such a wonderful conversation before we let you go is there uh, where can people read you recently and uh are there conversations or appearances whether in person or on zoom uh where people can see or hear you talk about quick fixes Sure. So uh, I I think I said it earlier in the episode, but I've got a new article in The Point magazine about the present amphetamine shortage that came out just uh, just yesterday. Um, I actually have a longer article on just a completely different subject uh, about uh, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin and and the Freedom Budget campaign that's coming out in the Catalyst Journal, uh, the next issue. Uh, I've been working on that for a really long time, so I'm excited for that to come out. Um, and yeah, I've got some some book release events uh, in the near future. Uh, there's one in the uh, seminary co-op in Chicago on October 13th. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This is fantastic. Really. It's gonna, I think we'll, people are going to love it. People have been looking forward to it tremendously. We even shared a couple of screenshots weeks ago and people were all about yeah, it. Yeah, people yeah, love yeah. to cool. talk about drugs. People do love to talk about drugs. And it's a great book. Um, 
Yeah, really, I, really enjoyed I, it. I wanted to make a make a joke the other. Uh, I, I just had the New York release event last night. I wanted to make a joke at the beginning that I didn't, which is that um, we're here to do the worst possible thing you can do with drugs: talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Freud's joke book, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but this was really, really fun. Awesome! Thanks so much. Thank Congrats you. Congrats on the podcast too. Well, thank, thank you. you. This has been an episode of Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin, and today I was joined by Ben Fong and Patrick Blanchfield. This podcast is produced by Dan Yowell. Theme music by Formal Chicken.